So we've been doing this series on uh, living beyond fear, and um, today we're going to talk about fear of financial loss, of, of hitting a season of scarcity, of, of not having enough to make ends meet. Um, and uh, ironically, there was another meeting this week, and this, this topic about uh, is it okay to talk from the front about money came up. And, um, <laughs> and the room was sort of split, and I totally get it. Why? Um, and me being ridiculous, uh, I decided to preach on this anyway. So, um, if I'm not here next week, you'll know. <laughs> no, but uh, seriously, um, it, the reason that I want to talk about money, and I get why people don't want uh, to talk about money in church. On the one hand, you don't want the pastor trying to spend his next half hour trying to con you out of your money on your wallet for whatever it is that the church wants right now. Um, but Jesus had a lot to say about money. Our lives have a lot to do with money, and so I think it's very important to God how we view money and how we consider money. Um, and uh, and I just want to say that the church is in a great place, and the only thing that I want to say about church giving is thank you, and um, what a faithful, generous congregation we have. So that's all we're going to say about this church and, and giving right now. Um, but I think that, that money and the stress of money is a significant thing. In our lives. I know it's one of the leading causes of divorce in our country, and that means it's probably a leading uh, cause of divorce or a cause of, of stress and anxiety for us is just, just navigating money. Um, and uh, I'm also realizing in preaching this sermon, I have set myself up to be the worst dinner guest ever. Uh, last week I preached on the fear of death. Um, that was a taboo <laughs> subject already, and now I'm going into money. This is all around religion. So as long as I can do like fear of politics next yeah. week, I can get <laughs> to fear, of taxes. fear of taxes. Yeah, I can get all the subjects that you're not supposed to talk about at dinner out on the table. So uh, yeah, if you invite me on for dinner, it could be rough, but I'll try to make it good. Um, my my first instinct when I think of this scarcity or lack of, of finances that comes up in my mind is playing Monopoly with my dad. And my dad had this ruthless, ruthless strategy. I don't know if you know the game, but you're going around and you're trying to collect properties. And um, my dad would always buy the cheapest properties he could find really fast and then put hotels on them instantly. And the hotels were not green little nice things. They were big, red, scary things. <laughs> and as I came around to go and I saw the little tiny amount of money I would get from go and I saw all the big red things coming up, I thought there is no chance that I'm going to make it. And thus, I would get knocked out, and that would be the end of the game. Um, one thing in a board game, it's another thing in life. And I've had seasons where I'm going around the circle, and I'm seeing a bunch of big red things coming and going, I don't know how this is going to work out. Um, it creates a lot of stress and a lot of, a lot of anxiety. Um, I also got to experience it firsthand. My mom... Um, Moved up here, she got a master's degree in nursing while trying to raise three teenage boys and did uh, night shifts at nursing around the edges of that. And that meant that there wasn't a lot of finances to go around and, and it was stressful. My dad, on the other hand, was ready to retire when the housing market shifted and when all of a sudden a portion of his retirement was gone and, and he thought, well, now I need to work for at least an extra five years before I'll have enough in my retirement to be able to retire. And so those five years of working additionally after he was pretty much done with wanting to be a teacher were, were a rough season. And ironically, he passed away of cancer way before his projections uh, were set for. And so um, I think this, this uh, fear of what will happen with our finances um, can drive us in all sorts of different directions. And, and a number of them are not particularly healthy. But I also know that... Um, our anxiety around money is a heart issue. It's not actually a number issue. Um, it's related to the numbers, but it's not that. I've, I've sat with my grandfather, who was a pretty uh, wealthy investor, and seen him stress out over a fact of one of his investments not going very well, and the anxiety and the stress that came from that. And I also remember a particular night where I was in downtown Seattle, and um, I came across this homeless guy with a couple of my friends, and. Um, he had a cut on his head, and we cleaned up the wound and, and gave him a Band-Aid, and then we asked him how we could pray for him. And his answer totally struck me. And, uh, I mean, this was 20 years ago. It just stuck in my head. And he said, um, no, man, God 
blesses me way before I get a chance to ask him. I, I hadn't even prayed about what to do about this cut on my head, and you guys showed up and, and cleaned it up. Actually, God's providing for me before I can even think of it. So so if I could pray for anything, I guess it would be to pray for you guys. What could we pray for you? <laughs> and I sat there and I go, this guy has nothing. And yet he's living in an abundance. Um, and so there's a heart issue going on. And um, I want to I want to quote another homeless guy who had no bank account, and he was living in a very poverty stricken uh, society. And here's what he had to say: Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you'll eat or drink or about your body or what you're going to wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than the clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not much more valuable? Or are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by words could add a single hour of your life? Those aren't the words of a guy who was freaked out about losing his nest egg. And that's Jesus. And so, um, so I'm struck by what what has gone on in times of our hearts, and um, what does it mean to live beyond this fear of worrying about the bottom line in terms of finances all the time? I was talking to John Westfall about this this week. He is not actually lying on a beach in Tahiti <laughs> uh, writing his book. No, he said he's around, but um, I was talking to him about this and. Um, one of his insights was that uh, it's often not people in poverty that are worried about poverty or losing what they have because they're making their way through it. Um, it's it's having a lot, but you haven't experienced poverty and you're scared about what it would look like if we didn't have the resources that we have right now. What would it look like to not have the lifestyle that we have right now? Um, and I think these words that we're going to look at, it's First Timothy 6, um, 17 through 19. If you have a Bible and you feel like heading there, but it's, it's Paul's wisdom to share with his congregation to Timothy. Uh, it's kind of one of those last quotes of the book where he's saying, Timothy, here's the stuff to share with your congregation. And um, it's sweet, sweet medicine for this fear of scarcity. But it, it starts off with the words, um, here's some words of advice for those who are rich in this world. And um, my first reaction to that is, well, that's not me, so I guess it's for somebody else. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through some stats and some information to kind of get at this sense of what does it mean to be rich or poor. Um, and I think it'll help give us some perspective. So uh, there was a poll done of uh, people who, have, who make over $500,000 a year. That's a lot of cash. And they were asked, are you rich? About half of them said yes, and half of them said no. So... So that, but that's, that's a particular small group of people. So there was a Gallup poll done uh, just a few years ago, uh, and that stretches over the U.S. wide broadband of uh, people. And um, it was to try to set a mark on what it means to be rich. And um, this Gallup poll came to the conclusion uh, after, after the survey. The survey produced this result. If you make over $150,000 a year, then you're rich. Well, that I guess you're not. Um, and, and we're a country where... Uh, I think the fear of loss and the fear of scarcity abounds, despite the fact that we have tremendous resources. So I, I compared that to another website, which is really cool to look at. I really encourage you to go to it. It's called Global Rich List. And uh, what's cool about it is you can actually see things from a global perspective. And so you can type in how much money you make or different numbers and see where that ranks on the world's scale of uh, what you have. So... Um, if you type in that you make $1,800 a year, not a month, a year, uh, that puts you in the top 20% of money earners in the world. Top 20% is $1,800. The poverty line in America is $11,800, and that amounts to the top 14% of the world. And if you happen by some chance to make $25,000 a year, you are in the top 2% of the world's earners. That is a crazy, crazy number. Um, but if you don't like stats and numbers, I'm going to put it another way. Top 10% of the world. If you can say yes to three of these <coughs> next four things I'm going to say, 
then you're in the top 10%. Ready? Do you own more than one pair of underwear? I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have a means of transportation? Not even a motorized means. That means car or bicycle. Um, do you get to choose what you're going to eat for one meal out of the day? And do you own at least one pair of shoes? If so, if you can say yes to three of those four, you are in the top 10% of the world. Um, I think it's fair to say that Paul's writings to the words who, those who are rich might apply to us. And I'm not in any way trying to downplay financial hardship. Um, I've been in that stress and struggle, and um, I have had times where I didn't want to pick up the phone because I knew there were creditors on the other end, and I have seen people lose lots um, in poverty and um, losing a car that you use to get to work, and being homeless. Those are brutal, cyclical things that are, are ruthless. Um, but the reason I share all that is to say that um, perhaps our perspective on money, on scarcity, and on what it means to have money, or what it means to have little, might have gotten uh, tweaked by our society in a way that may not be healthy or godly. So, um, so I was trying to get at what does it look like for our society to view money, and I ran across this quote from uh, Donald Trump, not my favorite homie in the world, but I'm going to share his quote. Um, He who doesn't believe money to buy happiness just doesn't know where to shop. Um, and there, as much as I don't like that quote, there's some truth to it. And if I really dig into it, there is a sense in us that money can somehow buy for us happiness and comfort. And that therefore, if I don't have money, then I lose my happiness and comfort. And to put it in really down-to-earth terms, am I still happy if I can't stop at Starbucks? on the way to work to get my coffee. Um, I like the luxuries. I like the streaming cable. What am I going to do on a Friday night if I can't binge watch my shows? Um, I feel that rub. What it would be like to lose that is scary for me. Um, but I think there's even a, a deeper level, and it's, it's something that uh, we got at in singing the 25th song. Um, and that is, that is control and security is involved in this, too. If we lose um, our nest egg, maybe we lose our control and our sense of, are we going to be okay in security? Um, Henry Buckley said, save a part of your income, begin now, because the man with surplus controls circumstances, and a man without surplus is controlled by circumstances. Um, that sounds really wise, but there's an illusion there that somehow we are in control of what we have to find. Um, we don't need God or other people if we have a good enough rainy day fund. And that bubble uh, can break so easily, so easily. Um, that idea that everything is okay as long as we have money, it's, it's an illusion. Um, at the bottom of all this, we fear of losing what we have because at some level we trust it. And that's why I've named the sermon, In God We Trust. Um, because Paul's words that we're going to read out of 1 Timothy, um, really push us on this idea of what do we trust. So, um, here we go. First Timothy 6, 17 through 19, words of wise Paul for a congregation like ours. Command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. Because in this way they will lay up a treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Let's pray. God, we do want life. We want life from you. We want a life that is truly, truly life. God, we do put our trust in a lot of things besides you that are more tangible and easier to see and easier to hold on to and feel like they're under our control. And so, Lord, um, today comfort us. Reveal to us what it is um, that is most solid in this world, the thing that we can trust our life with, and the thing where we will get life from, and that's you. We love you, Lord. Amen.
So in this passage, Paul begins to, to build a house. Um, and he builds it on a couple levels. And first, there's, there's a foundational view um, about where we have what we have uh, that I think can really relieve this, this sense of, of fear or worry about finances. And that is, that is this, that God is the giver of it. That um, you can trust in God rather than trusting in the money that he's given it's ironic. Uh, I am going to hold up money. She called it. Um, <laughs> it's on it. God we trust on every single uh, bill that you have. It says, in God we trust. And to me, it's kind of ironic because, um, at least in my life, there is this is the one thing that makes me uh, want to trust God the least. Having enough of this, I go, wow, I don't, I don't need God anymore. And so it becomes this thing that I look to for my support rather than God. Um, we use money as a way to trust ourselves. And um, and if we don't have enough cash, it feels like somehow we failed. Um, and yet, when we don't have a lot of money, these seasons that come up, I think, in everyone's life, um, when you look at other places in the world, when you look at uh, different obstacles that have popped up, um, people began to band together and to care for each other in ways that we don't right now. Um, I'm not saying that going back to the Great Depression would be fantastic for us and our faith. I'm not saying I hope you get incredibly poor so that you can experience what it is to rely on God and to rely on other people. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying that maybe this American dream of having complete independence, efficiency, and support in oneself is actually a really isolating, if not that beautiful dream. The other thing is we, we give ourselves credit for it. Um, it's been a weird switch for me over the last 20 years of faith to, to try to keep wrapping my head around this. But there's this idea of God being the giver means that we're not the giver of it. Um, Deuteronomy 8, 17 through 18 says this, You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands has produced this for me. But remember that the Lord your God is the one who gave you the ability to there's a sense in which we can get so arrogant, and that's the word Paul uses, as we think that somehow we have made everything that we have. That verse, verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. Um, I was doing some studies on it this week, and in that word world, um, those who are rich in this present world, um, it's a very specific use of the word world. It's not the one from John 3.16, for God so loved the world. That is, for God so loved everything in creation, the cosmos, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will have life. Um, this is a different word. It's, it's ion, and it means era. It means this culture, this society in which you live, its values. Um, Command those who are rich in this present sense of how you view things um, not to be arrogant, not to put your hope in wealth. Because our view of money leads us to an arrogant place where we leave God out of the picture. Um, and Paul's warning is not one of, don't be a jerk. It's, it's, you're putting your hope on something that is so shifting and so unstable, it's bound to crash. Got another little illustration for you. I think as we go about our faith, we get money, right? And um, and it's so easy for this money to stop being on the side where we go, God, thank you for this. I appreciate that. And I'm going to try and use it wisely. And, I, and I, I'm getting some enjoyment out of it. You're taking good care of me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, our tendency is actually to be one of these people. <laughs> Man, I can't see anything except I do have this money, and when I don't have this money, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> and it isn't until it's gone that we go, oh, I guess i got to pray now. Um, we leave God out. Money has a way of just little tiny bits of money. It's right in the wrong spot in our life, and all of a sudden we got no perspective on what it is that God is doing to us and for us and carrying it. Um, got to avoid that spiritual arrogance that comes with it. Um, so Paul's foundation of this building is building where we go, oh, we don't have to be afraid, is this. 
Um, put your hope and trust in God. Because the riches are uncertainty, and he's the one who gives it to you anyway. So trust the giver, not the gift. Um, and it leads to this incredible sense of humility, because you realize that it isn't me that's capable. And it leads to this feeling of blessed because you look around and you go, man, God is taking care of me every which way I can. And like that guy that I ran into on the following night, you look around and go, man, God's providing me before I can even think to ask him for everything. I don't even have to come up with it because he already knows I need it. He's already doing things about it. Man, I am just blessed and taken care of at every turn. <laughs> so that's that's the that's the first part. The second part is a weird word that pops up in that um, Verse 17. Um, I'm going to read it again. It's a word that we don't think of when we think of, um, especially church. We spend a lot of time around in church. There's certain cultures that appear, and this is one of those words that doesn't come with it, right? Um, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything. Here's the crazy part. For our enjoyment. What? Enjoyment? I've heard so many talks on money in church, and they're usually about stewardship, and they tell these really scary parables where God gives people stuff, and then he checks up on them later, and if they haven't done a very good job, then they get like cast out or taken away from them, and, and it's really scary. And so we better get really, 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 really good at stewarding. Um, and there is some truth to that. What we have is a gift, and God um, does want us to use it wisely and for his kingdom and to do eternal, beautiful things with it. Um, but in that whole picture, there's the sense that there is no enjoyment in that. Um, and God wants you to enjoy life. And that's why he gave it to you in part. Um, and maybe that's radical to say, but I don't think it is. So, um, and what that looks like, at least for me, as I, as I consider that, um, it's not just living for pleasure. It's not doing whatever you want and going, sweet, I want it. Um, it's looking at it and going, man, what a gift from God. Wow, and it lets me have these other things that are a gift from God as well. And you end up with this sense of appreciation. I think of um, the Christmas carol, Scrooge, Marley, that whole thing. Like, Scrooge was really good at stewarding. But he didn't know what it was to live life. And through that story, something shifts and he begins to go, oh, his eternal thing's on the table. Um, and, and, and that whole thing ends with that pivotal line, which I have to say in a high voice, because it needs to be said in a high voice, from Tiny Tim. He said, God bless us all, everyone. <laughs> and that's the epitome of what it means to live in this place where we recognize that what we have said is a gift from God for us and for us to bless others with. To be blessed. And that is the opposite of fear. Um, Ecclesiastes 8.15 says this, after a very depressing book, by the way, of lots of things that you can't put your hope in and are just shifting sand. Here's his summary sentence. I commend the enjoyment of life because nothing is better for a man under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad and then joy will accompany him in his work all the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. Everything is a gift. What a nice, nice place to be. So enjoy with gratitude. Consider yourself blessed with however much or however little you have. We have a generous, loving Father who takes good care of his kids, and that's where we live. Now, the, the, the second story of this house, this is where the view comes in. Um, my house, first floor, you look back, you see a really badly taken care of yard and kind of fence. Um, second floor, pretty nice. Um, you can see some views. Uh, here's the second floor of Paul's house, and it, and it really brings us into what it is to live the life that is truly life. Verse 18 and 19, commend them to, be, to do good to be rich in their good deeds, to be generous, to be willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. There's one thing that we have talked about as we've done this thing on fear. Fear has a tendency to make us focus in on ourselves, to circle the wagons, and to draw back away from 
everything that God wants to give us. Um, scarcity makes us do exactly that. And yet, God's direction for us to achieve, to, to walk into this life he wants to give us, the life that is truly life, is actually looking outward and looking towards eternity. It's, it's the opposite of the circling the wagons. I'm going to read a weird parable for you. It's one of these ones that I have read over and over, and it just feels weird every time I read it. And Jesus, it's one of those times where Jesus, I think, preached, and people go, what the heck was he just saying? Um, but it's Luke 16. And by the way, the um, book of Luke talks more about money than lots of other books, because it has a very, very strong ethic on what, what God is trying to teach us about money. But here's the weird parable. Ready? Luke 16, 1 through 9. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager uh, was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management. Uh, you can't be my manager any longer. He's getting fired. And the manager said to him, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm too ashamed uh, to beg. And I know... Uh, I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, other people will welcome me into their houses. And so he called in each of his master's debtors, and he said to one, How much do you owe my master? And the guy said, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. Okay, take your bill, sit down, make it 400. Forgive half your debt. And then he asked the second, And how much do you owe? Well, a thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He said, All right, take your bill, make it 800. And the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than they are with the people of the light, than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. What we have in the way of finances and resources will come and go. But there is an eternity that is all around us waiting to be invested in. And God says, you can put your money to work there. Um, God is this generous, uh, abundant God who gives to us. And he's not worried about um, his losses in the process of giving to us. And he says, what would it look like for you to live in the same vein? Generous, blessing, not with the wagon circle not retreating, not trying to hold on to things so tightly that if you should lose them, you'll be in deep trouble. Let me read 18 and 19 again from our passage. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, be generous, willing to share, and in this way they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Then you may take hold of the life that is truly life. It's a habit of generosity and blessing. Um, Financial uh, wisdom might be to uh, slow down on giving when things get tight. And then I look at Jesus' favorite example of stewardship, a widow with hardly two points to rub together. And she gives a little money into the offering, and Jesus says, you know what? She gave more than all the rest. And what he's saying is her heart was in a place where she was receiving from God, where she was giving generously. And where she is available for God to use. Um, wide open spaces. It's free living. It's not not scary. It's not uh, tied down. But it's also counterintuitive. Have you ever been driving and started to slide? I got I see mm -hmm. the hood. Whew. Uh, I do not like that feeling. It feels like things are getting out of control. And the first instinct that you have is to turn the wheel and jam it back and going the direction that you want to go. And if you do that, you will spin further. And instead, what you do is you turn in to the road, the direction that you're heading, and then your wheels can get a grip and you can go. And um, so much of living in this kingdom that God has built is about lining ourselves up with who God is and his word, letting our wheels go that way, and then letting that get the grip. And it takes this, this shift of trusting God rather than just trusting our own resources. I have a friend, uh, John, met him. He's the, my small friend, Kim. And um, 
he lives in a in a mansion, kind of like the little building that's next to our uh, church. We have a little tiny building there. We're mostly made for pastors, so like a little tiny house. And Kim is a big dude. He's a Samoan. And he's got like five people in his family, and so they're all living in this tiny one-bedroom house. Um, and Christina and I have a, have taken in folks on occasion, and it, it's a stretch. It's hard. I mean, it, it takes a stretch. And then I look at Kim, and for as long as I've known Kim, he's had co-workers that he has taken into his house and lived with him in this tiny, tiny house. And it's the craziest thing because they don't have their life together or anything, and they're not always the easiest people. And, and Kim would invite me over and go, hey, Chris, you want to do Bible study with me? I do it every morning at 6 a.m. With, with whoever's living in my house at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, sure. <laughs> so I roll over there, and um, it's the weirdest, most awesome, beautiful thing I've ever seen. Because here's this big, giant guy living in this tiny, tiny house, um, and he's got way more people than the house can handle, and people are sleeping on the couch, and then we all do Bible study together at 6 a.m., and I look at him, and I go, man, he is living big. He is living a big life. And I'm a little jealous of it, because he's finding the life that is truly life, and sometimes I miss it. The Bible is full of these stories of God being abundant, and then saying, trust me, I'm there for you, I've got you, you don't need to fear, so live abundantly. Um, I'm going to run through a couple of stories. Uh, 1 Kings 17, Elijah is, uh, comes upon this widow, and he says, you know what, do you mind making me a meal? I need some bread. And uh, she says, well, it would be my last one, because you're asking me to cook for you with the very last bit of my supply. And uh, he says, well, go ahead and make it and see what happens. And so she risks. She doesn't keep everything for her family. She says, I guess this is the prophet. I will I'll feed him, like he says. And the craziest thing happens. She has enough for however long until it rains again. Out of that one little tiny bit, it doesn't make sense. The logic isn't there. You cook the bread, and then there's no more flour. And yet the flour keeps being there, and the oil keeps being there for her to keep doing this. John 6, feeding of the 5,000. Uh, there is Jesus going, well, these people have been here a long time. They need to eat, and they might pass out if they start heading home now, so we should feed them. And the disciples say, that's funny. We don't have enough. We can't feed all these people. You know how much money that is? And the disciples are freaking out about scarcity, right? And there's one little kid there who goes, well, I have lunch, but I can probably share it with these people. And that's where it stops. He goes, I'm just going to live generously and open to God, so I'll go get this from Jesus. Here's, here's five loaves and two fishes. And 5,000 people are fed. It doesn't make sense. But the generous kid focused <clears throat> on Jesus, not on his lack. The disciples saw fear and lack. Huh? Wedding in Cana, running out of wine, scarcity problem. Jesus goes, well, there's some dirty water over here. Maybe we can put that to use. 120,000 gallons of dirty water becomes 120,000 gallons of the finest wine. That's a lot of wine, people. Um, the parable of the sower and the seed. Some seed lands on nice places, some seed lands on other places. You don't get the perspective on any of these stories that somehow God is sitting there going, man, we are down to our last bit of blessing." better make it count. Your Heavenly Father knows what you need to seek first the kingdom of God. A homeless rabbi in Israel said that. And his words still keep coming true a thousand years later. Um, an alternative to fear is to rely on God. Live for him, for his kingdom. Let it lead you where it leads you. That foundation uh, without a foundation, houses crumble. That foundation is this. God is the provider. He's got you. The first floor, enjoy what you have. Maybe you can use it to bless you. Maybe you can use it to bless your closest neighbor. Um, be a good steward, but God's taking care of you, and he gives you what you have for your enjoyment. In the second floor, the real view, the beauty. Um, 
Live generously. The kingdom is available all around you to invest in. Pour into things that are eternal and you'll see wonderful, amazing things. That's the life that's truly life. That site, globalrichlist.com, that I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna I'm gonna share some uh, opportunities that it had to invest in. I'm not saying that we need to do these or that the, that you should do these or in any way trying to guilt anyone, but it puts this perspective of money also back in into frame in terms of eternal stuff. Um, Eight dollars can buy you fifteen apples, roughly, from the store. Um, it can buy twenty five fruit trees for farmers in Honduras. Eight bucks. Um, 30 bucks can buy you a DVD box set of your favorite show for one season. Uh, or it can get a first aid kit for a village in Haiti. Um, $73 can buy you a very cheap mobile phone. Uh, it can build a mobile health clinic for AIDS orphans in Uganda. $83. Um, okay, here's the one that, that's absolutely freaking me out. $2,400 can buy you a next-gen flat screen, maybe with even a little curve to it, kind of nice. Uh, it can school an entire generation of children in Angola, in a village in Angola. And I don't say that to go, man, you should feel guilty when you go to Starbucks because you had your $8 coffee and you could have bought 25 trees for farmers. Um, that's not anything what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that with a little more work, the opportunities are all around us. And it's just a matter of saying, this is where I'm going to put my trust and my hope in my life. And I want to see God bring life to other people. Um, missionary Jim Elliott, one of my favorite quotes that he said is, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. What you have, you're not going to keep anyway. There is no uh, trailer that comes behind your hearse to put in your stuff in. Um, so why not live generously towards God and towards others? I'm going to close with this with this amazing letter that was sent to a, a radio evangelist um, by one of his elderly listeners. Next Sunday, you said you were going to talk about heaven. I'm interested in that land. You see, I have a title there. Uh, I've had it for over 55 years. I didn't buy it. It was given to me uh, without money and without any price. But the donor purchased it for me at a tremendous sacrifice. I'm not holding it for speculation since the title's not transferable. It's not a vacant lot. For more than a half a century, I've been sending materials, good works, generosity, out of which this great architect and the builder of the universe is going to build me a home. It won't need to be remodeled or repaired because it will suit me perfectly, and it will never grow old. Termites aren't going to undermine its foundation because it rests on a rock of ages. Fire won't destroy it. Floods can't wash it away. I'm not going to put any locks or bolts on it because there's no vicious person in that land in which my dwelling stands. It's now almost completely ready for me to enter it. I'm going to abide there in peace eternally without fear of it ever having been taken away. I do hope to hear your sermon on heaven next Sunday from my home in Los Angeles, but I have no assurance that I will do so. My ticket to heaven doesn't have a date marked on it for the journey. There's no return flight and no permit for baggage. Yep, I'm ready to go. I may not be here while you are talking next Sunday, but if not, I'll meet you in my new house. In short, grab hold of God. Grab hold of the light that is truly life. Do not let fear hold you back from what God gives, because we have a God who loves us and takes care of us. Let's pray. God, we rest humbly in your hands. With however much, however little we have, thank you for taking good care of us. May we trust in that. May we be able to sit in that. May we relax in the space that says, you have given us enough. And then may we turn our eyes outward and say, how can we bless others in some small way the way you have blessed us? God, thanks for wide open spaces in which to live, places where we don't need to be afraid. May we trust in you rather than in